All right, guys. Excited about this message. The name of it is going to be Humpty Dumpty. <laughs> Many of you know the, the children's story of Humpty Dumpty. It goes like this. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men could not put Humpty together again. Now, <laughs> That's what this, this sermon somewhat revolves around, what that story tells us. It's a short little, little rhymy story that we tell kids in little children's books, but that little short story can really say a lot if you break it down. And so using that and some scripture, I'm going to use it to get a very important, important point across in this message. And the message is this, it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter how good or bad things are going in your life. And most of all, it doesn't matter how high up you are on the totem pole. It doesn't matter how much power or authority you have. It doesn't matter what rank of leadership you have. We all must pray and we all need prayers. We all need God in our lives. We all need God. And a lot of people get to a point where they think in a certain point in their life, they've got it all together. They feel on top of the world. They feel like they've got all this power and wealth and authority and dictatorship. But at the end of the day, you all, we all need Jesus, period. In fact, the higher up you go, the more you really do need him. Oh, goodness. Because if not, and you get full of your pride and your arrogance and your ego and, and you know, you don't you think you don't need God in anything and you think the higher up you are, the more you don't need him, which really the opposite is true. You really need him even more. But if you keep that mindset, what you do is you set yourself up for a great fall. Like Humpty Dumpty. But anyway, <laughs> but but let's let's get into this. Let's get into this. Starting out here in First Timothy chapter 2 it says this paul says i exhort therefore that first of all supplications prayers intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men let me just say this it's not only it should not only be of all men but for all men prayer and thanksgiving should be not only of all men but for all men as well in other words, we should all be wanting to pray and have a prayer life with God, but, but we should also be willing to pray for others as well, not just for ourselves. We all need some intercession from time to time. We all need to give thanks. Sometimes, and I've explained this before in a sermon, but let me say this again. Sometimes, for some folks that are Christians, when things are bad in our lives or going kind of rough, we get mad at God and we don't want to pray. And then we wait till something good happens. And then we want to thank him and pray to him and praise him. And then some of us are the opposite. When things are going good, we feel like, well, oh, everything's all right. I don't, you know, I ain't got to really say nothing to God. You know, I ain't really got to address him about nothing. But then when things start kind of going downhill, we freak out and, and, and then we're on our knees praying and God, what's going on? Lord, I need you. But the reality is if you want that relationship, which we all should strive to have, if we want that relationship with Jesus, we should be about having a prayer life, no matter what's going on in our lives. It shouldn't matter if it's all good or all bad or in between. We all need God at all times, regardless of how things are going, how things are playing out. So not only should we pray, but we should be able to pray or be willing to pray for others. And let me say this, a lot of times um, we, how do I want to put this? We know as Christians that we should be praying for our enemies but a lot of times we have it in our minds that we're only going to pray for certain folks. We'll pray for people that we like, people that think like us, people that look like us, people that, that, that we encounter regularly, people that we know personally, people that we love and like and adore. 
But we should also be willing to pray for strangers, folks we don't know, and people that we don't like, people that uh, may be an enemy to us, or people who may have made some things in our life hard. We should never get to a point where we have such a hatred that we refuse to pray for somebody. And a lot of times it's because we have vengefulness in us or a grudge that we're holding. And what happens is when we should be praying for our enemies, instead we wish bad upon them. Or we want to pray against somebody, pray for all types of bad things to happen for somebody. That's like borderline witchcraft. We as Christians should pray even for our enemies. It's something that humbles us, but it's something that makes our father, heavenly father, proud. It might make other people laugh at you and think you're crazy, but it makes the father proud. And so that's really what it comes down to. It, 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 listen, it's not about how you feel about it. It's about the fact of the matter. Verse two, look at verse two. It says for Kings and for all that are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. So this is a continuation of the first verse. It's not a whole nother sentence. It's a continuation. So not only just for all men, but even for Kings as verse two says. So let me pause and say this. And we know some places, some countries, they may have a king or queen or whatever, but in other places, it may be a prime minister or a president, whatever title you give for your head honcho leader of your land, whatever. And it could be anything else on a smaller scale, leadership on a smaller scale, maybe a mayor, a governor, you know, or maybe something not necessarily to do with government. It could be, you know, a, a, a principal or a superintendent of a school or, you know, the, 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 the pastors of churches, whatever. But anybody that's got some type of power or leadership or authority over a group of people or a town, a state or the whole country, listen, they all should be praying. They should not get high up on their high horses and think that they're too good for God now, but we should also be willing to pray for them as well. And sometimes we think that when someone's high up, we assume that their life is good and that they've got a lot of money and they've got all these things going for them. And we think they don't need prayer, but they really do need it because if they are over you, come on, think about it. If they're over you in something, If they are a leader over you, you really, really, really should be praying for them. You should be praying that they would treat you right if they're going to be a leader over you, that they would lead you in the right direction, that it's not just the blind leading the blind into a ditch, as the Bible would put it, that their eyes would be open, that they would know right from wrong, and that they would choose to do right. Pray for people to uh, pray for godly people, God fearing people to be in high positions, things like that. Let me say this. I know a lot of people have their, uh, their thoughts, their comments on our current president, Donald Trump. Let me just say this. I didn't vote for him or Hillary Clinton. I didn't vote for either one of them. I, I just, I, I just, I didn't know what to make of it. I just, <laughs> I just really didn't know what to make of this presidential election. Just didn't know what to think, but I'll just, <laughs> but, but, and, and not to, you know, try to force any thoughts or opinions on anybody. But my point is, regardless of what I think or feel, or regardless of what any of us think or feel at the end of the day, whether you support what has happened or not, it's important for us to still pray for our leadership, which is something that I'll admit I need to do more. I haven't really been up to par with it the way I should be, but we all should be. You may say, well, well why? I don't, I don't understand. Da, 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 da. Well, a lot of people, because they don't like Trump, wish him bad. But the thing about it is to wish him bad is to wish the whole country bad because he's over the whole country. So it's, it's kind of like setting ourselves up for disaster when we want him to fail. Uh, you you, you kind of get what I'm saying. So my point <laughs> is that no matter how high up on the totem pole somebody is, and regardless of whether you like them or not, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't pray for them. Pray that 
they have a, a change of mind, a change of heart, that they would follow Christ, that they would want to do the right thing and not go by greed or wealth or, you know, abuse of power, that they would use their power but not abuse their power. Things like that. If you want everything to go in the right direction, why would you not want to pray? Why would you be against hoping that things work out for the best? It's just, you, you see what I'm saying? You're really just setting yourself up, ourselves up for disaster when we wish bad. So just something to consider. But anyway, verse three, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. The fact of the matter is this. You may be a king, you may try to be a lord over people, but Jesus, as we know, is the king of kings and lord of lords. So no matter how high up you go in this world, Jesus is always higher. So he should be your source. He should be the one you go to in prayer. He should be the one to you go for or, or, or go to for, for the true power. This world can only offer you so much power and so much strength, but really it should be the Lord who strengthens you. It should not be, well, I got this myself. It should be, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So keep that in mind. Go with me to second Kings. Now, let me say this. When you look at Humpty Dumpty, it starts out with somebody named Humpty Dumpty. And some people, it, it really depends on, you know, what book you read or, you know, what paper you see it in, what, you know, internet article you see it in. Because different stories have people who rewrite them and interpret them different and put different cartoon pictures of stuff up differently so in some instances of Humpty Dumpty you may read a book or you know see some type of illustration of Humpty Dumpty and they may portray him as an actual human a man when I was a kid the portrayal I saw of Humpty Dumpty was basically a giant egg <laughs> right some of y'all know what I'm talking about he was just this giant egg with a face and he had arms and legs like a human but he was this huge egg and so when they showed the the little cartoon picture of him on the ground broken after he fell off the top of the wall he was just this you know this cracked open egg basically <laughs> you know so it's kind of kind of funny but but however you want to look at it let's just look at it from the perspective of Humpty just being a, a regular person someone who's high up on a wall and will use that symbolically to represent power to be over some people so we got somebody named humpty dumpty he's on a wall but somewhere in this rain he has a great fall <laughs> so he falls and obviously he's broken probably dead <laughs> but regardless he's broken and he can't be put back together again and something that i thought about and i never really really thought about it until getting ready for this sermon because i was thinking that that's you know that's kind of crazy and, and and what came to my mind is this at the end of the story it says all the king's horsemen and all the king's men couldn't put humpty together again now let me say this that right there says a lot that the king was not able regardless of his power <clears throat> he was not able to put humpty together again and and but the cool thing it was like he knew he couldn't do it which is why he had other people try to do it oh goodness sometimes when you get real high up in power and you got a lot of people under you expecting a lot from you you actually begin to realize just how powerless you really are because you can only stretch yourself so thin you can only help so many people you can't be a people pleaser all the time you can't always give everybody what they want all the time and some questions you just don't have answers to but you serve a god who has all answers because he's all-knowing 
He can give you the strength to endure having to help all that, that you can, but you've got to be willing to be humble enough to realize, Hey, no matter how high up I am, I don't have it all together, but there is someone higher who does have it all together, who can help me. So the king, whoever the king is in the Humpty Dumpty story, he knows he can't fix it, so he's got somebody else on the scene to fix it. But it's said that the kings, all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again, but this is the part that tripped me out. This is the part that really tripped me out when I thought about it, getting ready for the sermon. And it's the part that says all the king's uh, horses. Now, I know sometimes when people read the story, it's all the king's horsemen. They say all the king's horsemen and all the king's men, but usually the story is all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. And when you think about it, it's trippy because it's like, why in the world would the king try to get horses to put somebody back together, even if it isn't a human and it's an egg? How are some horses going to, you know, how are horses going to fix this problem? It just doesn't add up. And so it's kind of funny. It's like, like, okay, I can understand him trying to get some people, but some, but you know, but some horses, how the, how, how some horses going to fix this problem. But sometimes, and it just goes to show you, sometimes we try, when we see we can't fix things and other people around us or under us can't fix problems, sometimes we get desperate and try to do what, try to solve problems by whatever means necessary. And we find ourselves doing some things that's quite crazy. And so when we still don't fix the problem, we're not surprised, but yet we're still mad and frustrated. Knowing good and well what we tried to do wasn't going to work from Jump Street. So let that simply be a reminder, once again, that no matter how high up we get in life, whether it be in ministry, whether it be in our careers, whether it be in our friendships, our relationships, you know, uh, whatever, in school, whatever it is that you're pursuing, whatever it is you got going on in life, no matter how high up you get, no matter how much power you're given, there will be points when you realize just how actually powerless you are without God. You've got to have Jesus on your side you're never going to be too high up for him or too good for him but second kings looking at uh verse one of chapter five it says this now naaman captain of the host of the king of syria was a great man with his master and honorable because by him the lord had given deliverance unto syria he was also a mighty man in valor but he was a leper I've gone over the story other times in, in the past and other sermons, so I won't drag the story out for too long. But just going over this verse real quick, you've got this man named Naaman. He's a captain, and he's a captain over a very successful army, and the Lord has given him many victories, so he has favor with God. He's a man of valor. He's got a lot of prestige. He's made a name for himself, but he's a leper that poses as a problem to him because in the old testament times the the disease of leprosy was a big deal it was this disease that would cause uh problems with the skin the skin would begin to rot and become uh white and all these other gross looking colors and it was just it was gross and it was just the flesh would just be eaten away slowly over time and other people could get it and so people if people knew you had leprosy they would back up they didn't want to touch you they didn't want to get what you had and leprosy the reason why it was such an issue wasn't just the fact that it was this flesh eating problem it was also the fact that leprosy was equated with sin people believed that if you got leprosy you must have done something wrong <laughs> for for god to have just struck you with this uh problem and so <clears throat> so if you had leprosy you were looked down upon and people didn't want to have nothing to do with you. It was even to the point where if you were walking up the street and people saw you in, in public places, people would yell, unclean, unclean. This person's unclean. And they had to make this big public display of you so that people would, would acknowledge you and know to, you know, kind of stay out of the way. 
to watch out for you, to, to not get too close to you. And there were even times where people would want to quarantine you, separate you from the general public altogether until you either got healed or died out or something. But, but they, just, they just didn't want leprosy to be just hanging out in the general population. And so my point is, it's something that if you had it, if you had leprosy, it could pretty much ruin your career if you had some type of successful career, which Naaman had. So he was someone who had a lot of power and a lot of authority and a lot of respect, but he had to keep the leprosy hidden and under control, but he could only control it for so long. So he needed help. And even though he had all this power, he was powerless against the very thing that was attached to him. So he desperately needed help and he needed it fast, lest it got out of hand and ruined his career. Because it didn't matter how much people liked him and how many victories he won, if this problem got too out of control, people would want to back up from him. People would want him separated. He would lose his position. He would lose his valor. He would lose all that he had gained. So no matter how high up you go, and this is just to reiterate the point, no matter how, how, how high up you are, you still need God. What ends up happening is he meets up with the prophet Elisha, a man of God named Elisha, and he's, he's seeking out help, and Elisha is telling him to go down to the Jordan River and dip down in it seven times. And Naaman, he's butthurt about it. He thinks it's stupid. He, he ain't going to go do it. But the servant that came with Naaman tells him, hey, go ahead and do this. His servant talks him into going ahead and going down to the Jordan River and dipping down seven times in it. And he does it. He goes and he gets into this river and dips down in it seven times. And look at what it says, verses 14 and 15. It says, Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. So he sought out God's direction from the man of God. He went on ahead with God's direction. And he was healed, verse 15, and he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and came and stood before him. And he said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. So he's saying, Listen, I've heard some things about some other gods, but after what I've experienced today, after the experience I've had, after the healing that I've had, after the rescuing I've had out of my situation, I know that there is one true God, this God that's over the, the Israelites, his chosen people. And we know today as Christians, we, listen, it doesn't matter if you're an Israelite, an American, whatever. If you choose Jesus, that God, the, the one in the Old Testament that they called the God of Israel or the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If you choose Jesus, if you choose to believe him and accept him as your Lord and Savior, that same God is your God as well. So Naaman's saying, hey, this, I know this is God. There is no other God like this God. There is no God like Jehovah. So he got what he needed, but of course he had to humble himself and follow the directions of of God no matter what it looked like go with me to Isaiah Isaiah 14 now there was this big fallout in heaven because Lucifer who we now know as Satan but before he became Satan he was an angel originally named Lucifer a very important high-ranking angel who pretty much had it made he had the life, but he decided that he wanted the attention that God had. He decided he wanted the worship and admiration that God had. He wanted to be in the position of the creator, even though he wasn't the creator. And so he decided to rebel and he convinced a third of the angels to rebel with him. And what happened? He fell from heaven or he had a great fall. 
So the biggest Humpty Dumpty in the Bible is Lucifer or Satan as we know him now. He had the, the biggest fall. This mug fell from heaven. <laughs> That's a fall. So he has a great fall, but let's look at what it says in Isaiah 14. Starting at verse 12, it says this, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. So what's being said here is this, that <clears throat> Lucifer has decided that he wants to exalt himself. And to sum it up, he wants to exalt himself above God. It says that he wants to ascend into heaven and exalt his throne above the stars of God. So he wants a throne that sits above the stars of God. He wants to sit on the mountain of the congregation. He wants to ascend above the heights of the clouds of the heavens. So all he's really saying is, I want to be high up. I want to be up high looking down low at some folks. I want a high position. I want to be exalted. I want to be glorified and magnified. That's what I want. And it says that he said this in his heart. It's one thing to just say something with your mouth, but when you say it in your heart, that's when you know it's down deep in you. Now, that's when you know it's a strong desire, something that is determined of a person. So we see his heart has become corrupted because of the jealousy that he has towards God and because of his arrogance, because of his pride. And now he's got rebellion in him that he would rebel against the very one that created him and made him the magnificent angel that he was meant to be. He had no legit reason to turn his back on God. He simply became power hungry. And in his power struggle, he caused rebellion throughout heaven. And so he falls from heaven. And so with that being said, let me say this. It's thanks to this attitude that Lucifer has or had, now known as Satan. It's thanks to that, that now many of us have that appetite. Many of us get to a place where we want power. But the problem isn't that we want power. The problem, like with Lucifer, the problem is that we want it for the wrong reasons. Or we want it without having to come under submission to God anymore. So either we want it for the wrong reasons or we want it, but we don't want to be under God's control anymore. We want to be literally in control of all things in our life, regardless of what God has to say. So we just want to try to boot, thro uh, boot God off of his throne and sit on it ourselves or sit even higher than him. And that's basically the summary of what this is that he's saying here. And if you think about it, it ties very much into what happened in Genesis. Now that I think about it, because in Genesis, in the beginning, you know, God, he had created Adam and Eve and da, 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 da. And he told him not to, uh, told them not to eat from that one particular tree. And what happened? Uh, Satan coming in the form of the serpent talked Eve into it. And basically what he had to say was, God's lying to you. You can go ahead and eat of this tree. The only reason God doesn't want you to eat of that tree is because he knows that when you do, you will be as God's. In other words, you will be on his level because you'll now know the difference between good and evil. Your eyes will be open and you'll see things and you'll know things that you didn't know. So you'll be on God's level. So basically what he did was he took what was in his heart, which was to be like God, because that's what he said. He wanted to be like the most high, capital H, talking about God. 
He wanted to be like the Most High. So now that he's fallen from heaven, he's decided to cause rebellion on earth the way he did in heaven. And what he does is he goes up to Eve and says, hey, don't you want to be like the Most High? Because, you know, if you disobey him and you rebel and you go ahead and you eat of that tree, that's what's going to happen. Oh, goodness. Goodness, goodness, goodness. Now you see why many of us in this world have that appetite. It's thanks to him doing that, talking even to that, that, of course, Adam and Eve sinned. And so now we're all born into sin. So since we have that bent towards sin, that's one of the things that happens with some folks. We go overboard with power, obsessed with power, power hungry for all the wrong reasons. Not to be in a good position to help people, not to bless people, not to be a true leader and be a shepherd over a people like a shepherd over a flock. Not because you care about folks, not because you want to lead people in the right direction, not because you care about the community, not because you care about the company, not because you care about the school, not because you care about the church or the ministry, not because you care about the household, not because you care about this or that, not because you actually care and you want to make a difference and you want to make a change and you want to see growth and you want to do this and you want to have, you know, you, you know. It, not not because of that, but because we want to lord over people, because we want to be able to look down on people and step all over people and see how we can press people's buttons and step on them like a doormat because in order to stay where they're at, they have to tolerate our nonsense because we now have the power. We want it because it's just going to make us feel good about ourselves. And we want others to either uh, boast us on and pat us on the back and flirt with us and tell, uh, tell us how much they admire us. And when they don't, now we're offended because we didn't get what we wanted because our ego wasn't petted. And thus, the cycle continues. No matter how high up you get, just reiterating this point, no matter how high up you get, we all need God. We all need direction from him. And the more, the more empowered you get, the more direction you need from God, which means that trying to overthrow God or dethrone God is not the brightest thing. I mean, you can't do it. It's not possible, but still trying to even do it is, is just not the brightest idea. Trying to push the very one out of the way that you need the most is not the brightest of ideas. But now we see why we get to that point. Sometimes it's thanks to the enemy of our soul. Look at James verse or James chapter four, verse seven. It says this, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. We've heard that quoted many times and I have too, but I just now realized something when getting ready for this sermon and it's this, this right here would have been a good verse or, or a good, uh, quote for one of the angels to say during that rebellion in heaven. It would have been, it would have been a good thing for an angel to say that, like, you know, when, when Lucifer was stirring up trouble and going up to the angels, probably saying stuff like, Hey, God's holding out on us. He's holding back from us. You know, if we rebel against him, we, we can be like him. We can, you know, kind of like what he did with Adam and Eve. Oh, well, you know, don't you want to be like the most high? I want to. Come on. Why don't you join me? We can do this together. You know, you help me out. I can give you some power. Right. So, so while he was up there stirring up trouble, getting, trying to get angels to rebel, it would have been really cool. And maybe it happened. Maybe it, it didn't. I don't know, but it seemed like it really would have been cool if one of them, one of the angels had just walked up to all the other ones and was just like, Hey, submit yourselves therefore to God, <laughs> right? And resist Lucifer. Cause that's what he was called at the time. Instead of the devil, resist Lucifer and he will flee from you. In other words, if we continue to obey God instead of rebelling, and we continue to serve him, the one who created us, the one that if not for him, we wouldn't exist. If we would continue to submit to him and worship him and obey him, 
because we got it made and we have no reason to rebel, then we would be resisting what Lucifer is saying and then he'll have to go away because he sees we're not going to listen. <laughs> he'll have to flee. He'll, he'll leave. If you ignore him, he'll go away. That's, that's how he say it today. Just ignore him. He'll leave if you ignore him. Just leave him alone. He'll, he'll walk off when he sees you're not paying attention. That's what, that's what should have happened. But anyway, I just thought I'd share that. So anyway, <laughs> but regardless of whether or not somebody actually said that and brought that to their attention, I'll bring it to your attention. Continue to obey God serve him continue to submit to him no matter how high up you get and you will in turn resist the enemy and he will flee and it will keep you from your flesh getting in the way of trying to step all over people and god to be power hungry just thought i'd throw that out there finally the last place i want to look at is luke chapter 4. jesus sets the example for us Jesus got baptized and it was this, you know, big display, a big thing. And of course the enemy wants to cause trouble and attack your life and bring in temptation either right before a big breakthrough or right after you got a big progress, big promotion, big, you know, a display of God's favor in your life. He always wants to try to shut something down right before something gets started or right after something really big is, is getting started up. So it says this in Jesus being full of the Holy ghost returned from Jordan, which is where he was baptized and was led by the spirit into the wilderness being 40 days tempted of the devil. Skip down to verse nine. It says this, and he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle on the temple and said unto him, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down from hence, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against a stone. So the, the enemy, the devil, has Jesus up on this high place, on, on the pinnacle of a temple, they're up high, and he's saying, cast yourself down, throw yourself down. He's saying to him, take a great fall. Mm -hmm. So Lucifer or Satan now, who's the made a fool of himself, who's become the, the Bible version of Humpty Dumpty. Now he's trying to make a fool out of Jesus and trying to get him to be the ultimate Humpty Dumpty, trying to talk him into some crazy stuff, trying to get him to take a great fall. Go ahead and throw yourself down off this building. Take a great fall. You'll be all right. And what he tells him is, oh, well, you know, I, you, you can do it because if you really are the son of God, if you really are Jesus Christ, then you can do it. And you won't be hurt. The angels will come and they'll rescue you and they'll help you and they'll keep your little precious foot from getting hurt. And although what he's saying is true, Jesus could have thrown himself down and it wouldn't have been a big deal. That's besides the point. Jesus knew that he didn't have to prove himself to Satan. He didn't have to prove to him anything. So look what it says, verse 12. And Jesus answering said unto him, it is said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So he responds, letting him know, you shouldn't, even, you shouldn't even be tempting me. Who do you think you are? You ain't fooling nobody. You do not have to prove yourself to anybody, especially when they're trying to get you to do something that will get you out of character, something that, that will cause you to do something against what God has said to do. Because all that is, is someone puffing up your ego to feel like you got to prove something. And what happens is when you, when you get puffed up and you're trying to show off in ways that causes you to step out of God's will, you take a great fall because pride comes before a heavy fall. Jesus knew better. He wasn't going for it because he knew who he was. When you know who you are in Christ, you won't have to go on the power trip. You won't have to always step out of character and, and do things you shouldn't just to try to prove something to someone who isn't worth your time. And verse 13 says, and when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. 
So what did Jesus do? He continued to submit to God the Father. And in his submission, he resisted the devil. And so the devil had to flee. And I'm saying that to you. Whatever it is that God has blessed you with or power that God is about to bless you with in leadership or whatever you're seeking or whatever you may already have, don't let it go to your head. You need God. I'll pray us out of here. Heavenly Father, I thank you for another time to minister another word. Lord, I will pray that this message would bless people. Lord, I pray that people will continue to seek you, seek your will and your ways, that we would all continue to submit to you so that we can resist the devil and that he must flee. Even if it be just for a season, it's well worth it. Because now we'll know that when the next season comes around for temptation, we'll know what to do. We'll know how to handle it. We'll know that from experience that as long as we continue to submit to you, he must continue to flee. Lord, I give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.